The boy made a strange confession. I've heard none stranger in all my days of the priesthood. That doesn't surprise me. After he made it, he wept. A deep and terrible weeping from the cellar of his soul. You feel better now, my son? Yes, Padre. Then he asked for you. You are not his father. His father's dead. And his mother. Surely he told you that. Yes. You do believe him, don't you? This is a dark thing. For Mark and for you. If it is true... If it is true. Every word. Maybe. But, Senor Mears, there were many words I did not understand. Mark's confession was fogged by terror. Since you left, have you had news of this new Jerusalem? Jerusalem's lot. I get the local papers sent to me. They run stories from time to time. The lots of ghost town. <laughs> Mark, take it easy. There are rumors of devil worship, mass murder, UFOs, you name it. But you know what really happened? Yes. Father, I told you what happened. I know, my son. But it was hard to hear, even harder to believe. So I wish to have the story from other lips, too. Senor Mears. I went back last September. <laughs> Seems another lifetime now. Jerusalem's lot. Salem's lot. Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Dramatized in seven episodes by Gregory Evans. Episode 1 I remember seeing the sign on the turnpike Route 12 Jerusalem's lot For a moment I I thought of driving by But I guess I had nowhere else to go So I turned off after a few miles, Route 12 became Jointer Avenue. I took a detour along the Burns Road where I'd lived as a kid, past the iron gates of Harney Hill Cemetery, then up the hill towards the Marston House. When I first saw it again, I, looking down over the town, I, I, I shivered. Even so, I couldn't resist it just had to take a look. Hey, mister! I hope you're not contemplating going further. Why not? This is private land. Oh, always was, but uh, as I recall, no one seemed to pay much mind. <laughs> That's so? Well, they do now. It seems like you've been here before. Yeah, I, uh, I used to live in the lot, years ago. Ben Mears. Larry Crockett, real estate. <laughs> How do you do? Yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be staying a while. Need a place to live. Uh, I, I don't suppose... The Marsden House? Yeah. <laughs> Look at it, Ben. Who'd live in that? You'd never sleep nights. Well, it's in a good position. Yeah, it's not for rent. It's just been sold. <laughs> sold? <laughs> You're kidding. Who bought it? <laughs> Look, Ben. Uh, here's... My car. Oh, thanks. I've got an office on Joiner Avenue. Call in. And maybe I can fix you up. I turned from the Marsden house and drove down the hill into town. It was a few days later that I saw the girl watching me. I was sitting on a bench in the park. She was nearby, in the shade of a gnarled old elm, 
reading a book. She kept glancing up. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I usually don't speak to strange women, but, uh, do we know each other? No, I, I mean, <laughs> that is, I... Uh, it's just that, uh, you've been looking at me for 15 minutes now, and, uh, well, it's very flattering. You're Benjamin Mears, right? <laughs> right, how'd you know? I'm reading this. There's your picture oh. on the jacket. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but now I do. Would you autograph it for me? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh. Hey, a library book? Well, I'll buy them a new one. <laughs> What's your name? Susan Norton. Uh, there. Oh, thanks. It's awfully good. Well, I'm glad you think so. I loved Conway's daughter, too. Ah, that's the minority view. <laughs> uh, look, Susan, uh, can I buy you an ice cream soda? I was just getting a hanker for one. It was then in that soda parlor that I first saw Mark. To be honest, I hardly noticed him. I only had eyes for Susan. I bet you don't even remember. Too busy with my friends. One of them was Danny Glick. Strange. Yeah. How could we have known that in just a few weeks, our lives would all be tangled up together? I know, that's so annoying, just because he's younger than I am. Anyway, I got a new one, the ghoul. Cool, what's it like? Oh, all things and claws, walking through a graveyard. Uh, I haven't painted yet, but I'll need lots of red, because it is so cool. I, mean, it's I plan to go to New York. Maybe next year. Mm. You, uh, you don't like the lot? Mm. No, I love it. I've lived here all my life. But enough of me. How about you? <laughs> me? What's a big city novelist doing in the thriving community of Jerusalem's lot? Population 1,300. Ah. Uh, would you believe uh, writing a novel? What? Here? In the lot? Yeah. What's it about? Uh, uh, are you gonna... You're dripping. Oh, mm, thanks. Sorry. I didn't mean to pry. I'm not usually gushy. No, no. No apologies, please. When I was a kid, I lived here, on the Burns Road, out near Harmony Hill. Oh, there's nothing there now but a little graveyard. Yeah, I know. We're not to look. Well, don't stop there. Why did you come to live in the lot? How long were you here? Uh, my, uh, my dad died when I was seven. My mom had a sort of breakdown. While she got her act back together, she farmed me out to my Aunt Cindy. Cynthia Stones? I stayed with Aunt Cindy for four years. She put me on the bus back to my mother about a month after the big fire. <laughs> I cried when I left the lot. I was born the year of the fire. Uh, Biggest damn thing that ever happened to this town, and I slept through it. Your aunt's house burnt down? Yeah. And now you've come back here to write a book? Yeah. Why? Why? Well, this place is my childhood, just like it's yours. That means it's haunted for me. You know, when I came back last week, I almost drove right by. I was afraid it'd be different. Well, things don't change here. Not much. <laughs> so I've seen. I like that. And life got pretty hard after I left the lot. Mom killed herself when I was 14, but most of the magic had worn off long before that. What there was, was here still here looking out on Joyner Avenue now it's like looking through a thin pane of ice like the one you can pick off the top of the town cistern in late November looking through that at your childhood what you see is wavy and misty some places it trails off to nothing but it's still there most of it Would you like to go to a movie tonight? <laughs> now, Larry Crockett, real estate. Straker. Wait, I'm not alone. Now get yourself a cup of coffee. I just come in. Move your cute little butt out of here now. <laughs> now, and get me one while you're at it. Mr. Straker. Glad to hear from you at last. No, you're not, Mr. Crockett. Not glad, not surprised either. You got my letter? Came last week. You've done what I asked? 
Sure, everything just like you said, Mr. Straker. Had the poster made up? Uh, very classy. Opening in one week, Barlow and Straker, antiques. Browsers welcome. We will put it up tomorrow, in the window of the shop. Consider it done. As for the master... I put padlocks on all the doors. Got the keys right here. <laughs> Unnecessary expense, you ask me. No one I goes near... I Mr. Crockett. I will collect the keys this afternoon. So you're moving in at last. Folks have been wondering... Mr. Crockett, let me remind you of what I said at our first meeting. You will not speak of our little deal, nor of myself and my partner, Mr. Barlow. You will do as I ask, and you will keep quiet. Mr. Straker, you're not from these parts. Uh, this isn't Boston or New York. Sure, I'll keep quiet. But folks will still talk. There's gossip already. The ignorant tattle of the townspeople is of no consequence. Mr. Crockett, do as I ask, and you will be a very rich man. Oh, but realize... talk about it, and I will ruin you. Understood? Understood. But remember, I, I made a condition here, too. Whatever you're doing in that house, making bombs or moonshine or $20 bills, I don't want to know. Agreed? <laughs> Agreed. See you later, Mr. Crockett. <sighs> My mama warned me about deals with the devil. <laughs> Mom, it was just great. We talked the whole afternoon. We just had so much in common. Hmm? Can I see his book? Mm -hmm. oh, Benjamin Mears, Air Dance. Well, it seems I read a review of this in the Portland paper. They, they didn't like it much. Well, I do. And I like him. Maybe Floyd would like him, too. You should introduce Mom. him. Mom! I just thought if you and Floyd Tibbetts are set to get married... What then... in God's name gave you that idea? I assume... You assumed that... wrong. Susie. I'm going up to get ready. May I have the book back, please? I'd like to meet this Ben Mears. I'll ask him to dinner. Tomorrow? Okay. And where are you going tonight? Portland. The cinema. What shall I tell Floyd when he calls? Now I'm renting a third-floor cubbyhole at Eva Miller's place on Railroad Street. Well, that'll please my mom. Eva's highly respectable. <laughs> I tried to rent the Marston house. You're thinking of the wrong place. No. Out near Harmony Hill. I saw Larry Crockett. He told me it had just been sold. <laughs> the Marston house sold? Yeah. <laughs> Renting's crazy enough, but who'd buy the place? Yeah, wouldn't tell me. Deep, dark secret. <laughs> that house was a wreck when I was a kid. Why did you want to stay there? Never been inside? Oh, no. I once looked in a window on a dare. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> once. You know the history of the house? What happened there? Yeah, a, a guy called Marston had it built in the 30s. Hubert Marston, 1928. Go on. Um, he was a recluse. Went soft in the head. Killed his wife and then himself, right? More or less. You know Marston's occupation? A retired gangster. And made his money running whiskey from Canada during Prohibition. Yeah, I heard that story. Well, isn't it true? Could be. Seems kind of innocent, though, from what I've heard of Hubie Marston. What have you heard? The murder happened in the summer of 39. The mailman called Larry McLeod smelled a bad smell. Larry tried the front door, then went round the back. Luckily for him. Why luckily? In the kitchen, Larry found Bertie Marston, Hubert's wife. Half her head was blown away. Oh, God. Been dead for days. Larry fetched Norris Varney, who was constable at the time, and they, uh... Well, they went in together. You've certainly done your homework. There was a fortune hidden in the house. <laughs> wow, I never heard that. When they went into the hall, they saw how lucky they'd been. The shotgun that killed Bertie was pointing straight at the front door. Oh. They'd been lashed to a chair with a string from the trigger to the doorknob. Hubie was more than just soft. He was a fully-fledged loon. They found him in the bedroom at the end of the upstairs hall, dangling from a rafter. How do you know all this? Well, like you said, I've done my homework. <clears throat> I read the papers of the time, spoke to a few people. Which people? The mailman, Larry McLeod, and Constable Varney's widow. 
This is for your book. You're writing about the Marston House, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, no comment. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Well, if you won't tell me that, tell me about when you went into the house. Ben? Uh, <clears throat> okay, if you really want to know, but uh, I don't think I can talk about that and drive. Let's find a place to pull up. When I lived in the lot, the kids I played with were all a year or two older than me. Well, they had a gang. The Red Devils. That summer, the summer I was nine, I wanted to be a Red Devil more than anything in the world. <laughs> but there was a test. My test was to go into the Marston house and bring something out. You know, booty. I, uh, I got in through a window. In a downstairs room, I found one of those snow globes. You know, there's a little house inside, and you shake it, it snows. Yeah. I should have left then, but uh, I, I had something to prove. So I, I went upstairs to the room where Hubie hanged himself. Oh, Ben. Light me a cigarette, will you? I'm trying to quit, but I, I need one for this. I was scared witless. I didn't dare look behind in case I saw Hubie Marston shambling after me with a noose. And at the top of the stairs, I... I got all my courage together and ran down the hall. I meant to dive into the room and grab the first thing I found and, and get the hell out, but the, the door... It was jammed. I, I pushed and pushed until suddenly it flew open. And there was Hubie, hanging from a beam. I, I could see his body outlined against the window. Ben, Ben, don't. Susan, it's the truth. The truth of what I saw then and what I remember 24 years on. Hubie, hanging there. Face green, eyes puffed shut, hands livid. Then... He opened his eyes. <sighs> you could have heard my scream for two miles. I ran down the stairs, out the front door, straight down the road. When I finally stopped, I... I saw I had the snow globe in my hand. I still got it now. You don't... Really think you saw Hubert Marston, do you, Ben? Well, I don't know. <sighs> Probably I was so keyed up that I hallucinated, or maybe it's true that houses absorb the emotions that are spent in them, and yeah. they, they hold a kind of dry charge. And the, the right person, an imaginative boy, for instance, can release that charge. I, I, don't, I don't mean ghosts. More like a kind of psychic television in three dimensions. <laughs> I slept with the light on for weeks after that. I've dreamed about opening that door on and off ever since. Whenever I'm in stress, the dream comes. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, not so terrible. We all have our nightmares. Hey, uh, come back to Eva's and sit on the porch for a while. I, ca I can't ask you in. House rules, but... Uh, <laughs> I got coke in the ice box and some Bacardi in my room if you'd like a nightcap. Here you go. Oh, cheers. Mm. Look at the Marston house. Hmm? The lights just come on. Oh, must be the new owner. That's not electricity. Too yellow and faint. A kerosene lamp? Well, they probably haven't got the power turned on yet. Maybe. I wonder who it is. Well, I dare say we'll know soon. May I, uh, join you? Please. <laughs> that was yeah. quite a story that you told me in the car. 
Yeah, I suppose so. There's nothing in your books like that. I mean, they're powerful, but there's nothing so... Morbid? <laughs> nothing like Hubie Marston dangling from that beam. <laughs> Will you come to dinner tomorrow night? My folks would love to meet you. Oh, home cooking? Oh, the homiest. Oh, I'd love it. I've been living on junk food since I moved in here. Six o'clock? We eat early in Sticksville. <laughs> Fine. I like you, Ben. Like you, too. I want to see you again, if you want to see me. I do. But go slow. Remember, I'm just a small-town girl. Am I supposed to kiss you now? Yes. I think that comes next. How's your head this morning, Weasel? It's fine, he was. Thanks for inquiring. Out late again, drinking at Dell's. Mm. Now, Ben was out late, too. I don't pick on him. With the Norton girl, right, Ben? Yeah, no secrets in this town. Susan Norton's real nice. Too good for Floyd Tibbetts. More coffee? Oh, thanks, Mrs. Miller. <sighs> Come right in. Hi, Weasel. Oh, Mike. Hey. Eva. Oh, sit hey. down, I'll get you some coffee. Mike, this is Ben Mears, the writer. <clears throat> Mike Ryerson. I do. <laughs> Mike, you okay? You look pale as death. Weasel, I got bad news. I was just out at Harmony Hill. When I turned in the drive and got out to unlock, there was a dead dog hung head down from the gates. Oh, my God. I'm pretty sure it was your spike. Oh, no. Mike, you, you certain? I got him out in the pickup. Take it easy, Weasel. He don't look pretty. How was the dog killed? Throat slit. Right there on my spot. Strung up like a steer in a slaughterhouse. What? When I lifted him down, I felt sick to my stomach. What sort of pervert would do such a thing? God knows. You're like the devil. Yeah, Larry Crockett. I need a service. Straker, I was just thinking about you. Maybe I'm psychic. You will procure a truck, a big one. Have it at Portland Docks tomorrow night. Yeah. Custom House Wharf with two men. Yeah, I got that. There are 12 boxes to be picked up. 11 are to go to the shop. The other contains a valuable sideboard, Hepplewhite. Your men will know it by its size. This box must be taken to the house. I got it. I want it in the cellar. Your men can enter through the outside cellar door. Uh, Mr. Straker, the this side... The padlock on the door will be left unlocked. It is vital they lock it behind them, understood? Understood. Follow all directions exactly. Now, Straker, we... Have a nice day. This is the first time we've seen a real live author up close. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Mrs. Norton. I don't quote from my own works. <laughs> Hi there, Bill Norton. Oh, hi. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. Ben Mears. I'm just fixing a barbecue. Oh, uh, can I help? Why not? Come on out. Uh, like a beer, Ben? Oh, I'd love one. Two or three, even. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're my man. <laughs> That's great. Do you hear about Weasel Craig's dog, Spike? Has mm. he run off again? He's always doing that. No, he was killed this morning. Hit with the car? No, sacrificed. What? I don't know about that, Mrs. Norton. Mike Ryerson went out to the cemetery early and found Spike hanging off the gate, ripped <sighs> right open. I heard Parkins Gillespie was of the mind that the dog had run down and a bunch of kids strung him up for a joke. <sighs> Parkins Gillespie is a fool. Maybe so. I'll get it. You, only last week I read about devil worship in some little town in Florida. Kids broke Mom. into a church and held unholy rites. You've been reading those papers at the supermarket checkout. It was the Portland Herald. One dead dog doesn't prove Satanists have come to the lot, Mrs. Norman. <laughs> so what's your explanation, Mr. Mears? Hmm? Well, you're a writer. I'm sure you can come up with something. <laughs> Who was it, dear? Dog of the devil. What? It was Parkins Gillespie. The Glick boys have gone missing. Danny and, uh... What's the little one called? Ralphie. Yeah. 
Went to a friend's house after school. Should have been home two hours ago. Mm. It seems it took a shortcut through the woods. But there's a good pass, and the stream's almost dry. Ah, oh, they're probably head out somewhere smoking cigarettes. But the clicks are worried. So Parkins is getting a few people together. I said I'd go. Oh, it's uh, 20 years since I've been in those woods, but if I can help... a boy. Danny! Dan! Ralphie! Ralphie! What's the time now? Uh, close on uh, midnight. Looks like flashlights up ahead. Oh, that'll be Gillespie and Tony Glegg. Park? Is that you? Bill! Stay there. We'll come to you. Uh, I can't figure it, man. This is the only way they could have come. Unless they wandered off the path. Well, why would they do that? The kids. Maybe they went after a woodchuck. One fell, broke his leg, the other won't leave it. Uh, maybe. Hey, you hear that? Hmm. Sounded like an animal. Well, that's the trouble. Wood's full of them. Uh, any point in searching off here? Oh, not in the dark. Too many deadfalls. Well... Ben, take care. You'll break a leg. Found anything, Bill? Uh, nothing. Marjorie will be frantic. When I find those kids, they won't be able to sit down now, for Tony a week. Tony Cullen. I'm sure the boys aren't to blame. And there's Isn't something it? here. Man? One of the boys. Thank God. Is he okay? Yeah, he's out cold. I'm bringing him over. It's Danny. Here, here. Lay, lay him down on my coat. Yeah, okay. Boy. Son, son, are you all right? Danny, the speak to me. Well, he doesn't seem to be injured. Came out Thank of the woods. God. Out of the dark. The bad thing. What bad thing? The boogeyman. The boogeyman. He's not making sense. He's in shock. Something bad must have happened. Danny, where's Ralphie? What's happened to Ralphie? Gone. Ralphie's gone. Gone. The boogeyman got him. Ralphie's gone. <laughs> Oh, my father, favor me now. Lord of flies, favor me now. I come to make sacrifice for your favor. I bring you reeking flesh and spoiled meat. With my left hand, I bring it to this place, consecrated in your name with the blood of a beast. Send me a sign to begin your work. I bring you this. You have been listening to episode one of Salem's Lot by Stephen King. With Stuart Milligan as Ben Mears, Teresa Gallagher as Susan Norton, and Danny Canaber as Mark Petrie. John Moffat played Straker, Matt Zimmerman, Larry Crockett, Shelley Thompson, Anne Norton, Harry Taub, Bill Norton, Don Fellows, Parkins Gillespie, Peter Yap, Father Grathon, Ronald Fernie, Mike Ryerson, Peter Whitman, Weasel Craig, Francis Jeter, Eva Miller, David Jarvis, Tony Glick, and David Freed, Danny Glick. Salem's Lot is dramatized in seven episodes by Gregory Evans, with music composed by Elizabeth Parker of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The director is Adrian Bean. Thank you.